Okay, everybody, uh, let's pick up where we left off. So the second video, I'm going to start with the electromagnetic spectrum. And where you can find more information about the spectrum is on our course page. So I'm going to click over, uh, go over to our course page. And if you scroll down, right here it says click on the thumbnail to view the geometry of the electromagnetic wave. Right, so that's that picture that we've seen before. And here, if you click on this, we can look at the electromagnetic spectrum. Let's move that a little bit so you can see that. Okay. Um, so you, by no means do you have to memorize the electromagnetic spectrum, but I do want you to remember something about the visible part of the spectrum. Okay. And so I'm just going to go through the other portions of the spectrum uh, pretty quickly. Um, our, our focus is going to be on the visible, but the way we do, well, the whole idea here is that we find in nature a whole range of different frequencies for electromagnetic waves, electromagnetic radiation. So we tend to classify different bands as different parts of the spectrum, different frequency bands, and, and realize that the... Uh, the transition from one band to another, from one portion to another, is not hard and fast. Okay, so there's a sort of um, uh, fuzzy barriers between them. But nonetheless, we've we've organized the electromagnetic waves into different uh, parts of the so-called spectrum. Okay, so what determines the part of the spectrum is the frequency. Um, as as we'll mention in a little bit, we'll reemphasize. The frequency of an electromagnetic harmonic wave does not change as it goes from one medium or material into another medium or material. That frequency is a constant for that wave. The speed of the wave and, and the wavelength of the wave will change when light goes from one medium into another medium. And again, we'll, we'll look at that in more detail in a little bit when we're done talking about the spectrum. So that's why we, we let the frequency be the determining factor as to what part of the spectrum we put this electro, certain electromagnetic wave in. Okay. Now, that being said, people like to talk about the wavelength of the wave. Um, and I think they tend to like to do that more than the frequency. And I think it's because we can sort of visualize the wavelength easier than the frequency. So in addition to the frequency, you might hear somebody talking about, oh, this wavelength is such and such that puts it in this part of the spectrum. But you got to be careful because, again, the wavelength changes when light goes from one material into another material. So we're going to talk about the free space wavelength. What's the wavelength of the light in free space? Okay, when we talk about the part of the spectrum. Okay. All right, with that laid down, let's go ahead and, uh, and look at the different parts. So we're going to start with lower frequencies. We'll go from low frequencies to high frequencies. So if, we're, if the frequency is below about 300 million or megahertz, that's the radio portion of the spectrum. Okay, and uh, those are free space wavelengths greater than about a meter, all right, from crest to crest. And um, if, if you guys, if we are drowning in radio waves right now, our rods and cones on our retina, they're not sensitive to those frequencies, so we don't see this radiation, but we're immersed in it. So um, AM radio, FM radio, uh, TV broadcasts are all going to be with radio waves uh, in the radio portion of the spectrum. Okay, um, we can generate radio waves pretty easily, but just with oscillating currents. So we can get a current oscillating in a transmitter, uh, an antenna, and send a radio waves pretty easily. All right, let's go up in frequency. So from about a billion hertz to about 3 times 10 to the 11, those are free space wavelengths from, what, 30 centimeters down to about a millimeter. And guys, you see, right, as the frequency goes up, the wavelength goes down. Because remember, the way, the way I think about this is the speed of the wave is going to be the wavelength, one of the valid expressions, right, is the wavelength times the frequency. So as frequency goes up, wavelength is going, free space wavelength is going to go down. 
Okay, so that's the microwave portion of the spectrum. Um, so it, it's a pretty big portion of the spectrum. And um, microwaves, some microwaves can be generated with circuits, but some of the frequencies are high that you have to do a different type of, uh, of generation involving accelerating charges. And microwaves are used for a lot of different things, as you guys are aware. We can cook with higher frequency microwaves and with lower frequency microwaves. Oh my goodness, what do we do with lower frequency microwaves? Yeah, we talk to each other with our cell phones um, and remote things can talk with micro, longer wavelength microwaves. So again, we're awash in microwave radiation also. Okay, let's go up in frequency. So from about 3 times 10 to the 11 to 3.8 times 10 to the 14. Uh, we are in the IR or infrared portion of the spectrum. Notice the free space wavelength millimeter down to about 780 nanometers. We're going to use nanometer a lot. Uh, it's convenient for particularly visible radiation. Okay, uh, micron will also use sometimes micrometers usually called microns. So we're a thousand microns down to about 0.78 microns. That's the IR portion. Uh, so now to generate IR radiation, of course it's generated naturally. Um, the sun delivers a lot of microwave, uh, infrared radiation, excuse me, as do um, a lot of objects at normal, what we would think of as normal temperatures. Okay, so in fact you and me Right, um, our, our, the atoms on our skin are generating infrared radiation. So IR detectors are sensitive to that. So even if the light, the visible lights are off and you have an IR camera, um, you, you'll see some uh, radiation coming off of people. Okay, um, uh, we make devices that uh, emit IR radiation. A uh, common device is uh, um, an infrared LED, light emitting diode. You'll find those in your TV remotes or remote for anything, really. Um, and some phone cameras are sensitive to IR radiation. I found that Android, uh, I'm sorry, I, I should, yeah, I mean, non-Mac phones, or non-iPhones, I should say, sorry. Uh, their cameras tend to be sensitive to IR radiation. I've seen some iPhones that are not. You, you, they don't pick up infrared radiation. My guess is that, uh, the, the the iPhone camera filters out the IR radiation, maybe to enhance the the, the photo. But if you have a, a your cell phone and a TV remote, just look at the TV remote, the end right, that you point toward the TV with your phone, and start pressing the remote. And as long as your battery is okay, batteries are okay, you might see some some flashes going on. Because your remote talks to your TV by flashing that infrared LED. Okay, uh, let's see. Let's go up in frequency. 3.8 times 10 to the 14 roughly to 7.7 .7 times 10 to the 14. Now that's a pretty narrow band, but it's a very special band because our eyes are sensitive to these frequencies. So this is the visible portion of the spectrum. Again, notice the wavelengths of roughly 780 nanometers down to about 390 nanometers. Okay, and um, we're going. Let's expand upon the visible spectrum. So I mean, I can just scroll down. If you click on that, you're just going to go jump down to here. The different frequencies appear as different colors to our photoreceptor cells on our retina. So we get the colors of the rainbow, which I'm, I'm sure you guys are familiar with. And um, officially, indigo is not part of the spectrum. So you might remember the uh, mnemonic Roy G. Biv to remember the colors of the rainbow. Uh, red, orange, yellow, green, blue. There is no indigo officially. Um, so we go right to violet. I, I think the eyes in there in the mnemonic because you need a vowel, I guess. But um, anyway, no indigo. Uh, now these free space wavelength ranges, again, are approximate. But I got this from a particular textbook. But if you get another textbook, there might be some discrepancy with these numbers, but they'll be close. Okay, so um, this little uh, picture here shows you the different colors. Now, this is not what a rainbow looks like. I realize that it doesn't have hard, fast edges, edges with uniform shades of red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet. But this is the best I could do. 
Okay, so um, in a real rainbow, you see this shading and this transition, right? This fuzzy transition from one color to the other. But the reason I did this is I just want to emphasize that the majority of the spectrum, the visible spectrum, is what we would call red. And yellow is, in fact, a very narrow band, okay? Um, now, again, you guys don't have to memorize this, except I do want you guys to remember Roy G. Biv, okay? So, and you know that the red, the Roy, red, right? That's the lower frequency or longer wavelength. So you should know Roy G. Biv, and red has a longer wave, free space wavelength than orange, than yellow, than green, than blue, than violet. Or in terms of frequency, red is the lower frequency, and then you go up in frequency as you go uh, through the rainbow colors. Okay, so just remember Roy G. Biv, and red is longest wavelength, uh, lowest frequency. Okay, all right. Um, oh, what, what are, well, we'll talk more about this when we talk about the eye. Um, your, but I'll mention it here. The rods and cones, that's what we call the photoreceptor cells on your retina because they look like rods and cones. Uh, they don't have a uniform response in terms of frequency. So our rods and cones have much more sensitivity right around here near yellow green, right around 580 nanometers uh, than like at the, this 700 portion of the red spectrum or the 400 nanometer portion of the violet. So if I had, you know, um, a red light, an orange light, a yellow light, a green light, a blue light, a violet light, and they're all giving the same power output, so I have the same intensity hitting my eyes, we would see the yellow and uh, probably to be the brightest. The green might be close, okay? So uh, right near yellow-green, that transition is where our eyes tend to have the highest sensitivity which is why some um, emergency vehicles, right? Traditionally, they're red like fire trucks, but some emergency vehicles I've seen in some municipalities are sort of that yellow green. And um, if you notice like uh, safety vests now tend to be yellow green uh, instead of fluorescent orange, okay? Because our eyes are most sensitive to those frequencies. Okay, so that's the visible part of the spectrum. Let's jump back up here and finish off our spectrum. Let's go up in frequency. And now we're in the UV or ultraviolet part of the spectrum. Wavelengths are starting to get really small, 390 nanometers down to 60 nanometers. So that's starting to be on the order of larger molecules uh, or molecules, okay? Um, and uh, let's see, ultraviolet light natural source, biggest natural source would be our sun, okay? Um, and artificial sources, Yes, we can create our, uh, our ultraviolet light. We can do it with um, semiconductor devices um, as well as other means too, okay, um, uh, with atomic transitions. So we can excite atoms and have them emit ultraviolet light. Okay, uh, go up in frequency uh, and we're in the X-ray portion of the spectrum. Uh, so again, roughly three times 10 to the 16 to three times 10 to the 21 hertz. Here now, we're getting extremely small wavelengths. And I switched over to this A with a circle. You may have seen that before. That's a special length unit called the angstrom. Um, and it's, it's, it's 10 to the minus 10 meters. Let me see if I can, let me try something here, guys. Do, 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 do. I'm switching over here, watch this. Oh, look at that. Oh my gosh. One angstrom equals one times 10 to the minus 10 meters. Okay, I promise I'll, I'll practice with my pad. That is terrible. Let me try that again. One. Oh, that's better. Well, sort of. Anyway, uh, so this is a special distance, this one times 10 to the minus 10 meters. It's not a, a multiple of three like, you know, 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 9. But um, you'll hear this unit a lot um, only because um, it, it was introduced because it's on the order of atomic dimensions. So it's sort of a special distance, the angstrom. Oh, the way you, sp it's A-N-G-S-T-R-O. 
M, and let me put a diacritical mark on the A. It's Scandinavian. I don't know what country, I'm sorry. Um, anyway, but that's the angstrom, and we'll, we'll, you'll see, hear that again. Um, I could put this in nanometers. There are 10 angstroms in a nanometer, so this would be 10 nanometers to 0. 0, 0, 0, 0.001 nanometers, but I chose to do angstroms. Anyway, uh, the, the number's not that important. Uh, that, that's the X-ray portion of the spectrum. We'll talk about X-rays more when we get to some atomic physics. And then if we go um, up in the spectrum, we get to gamma rays, although there is an overlap, if you notice. You see how the gamma ray frequencies, typically greater than 3 times 10 to the 18, well, that, that's actually part of the X-ray spectrum. But gamma rays we reserve for special emissions. So gamma rays are going to be coming from uh, nuclei, radioactive nuclei, um, or in matter to energy conversions, where, uh, and we'll talk more about this in special relativity, but you can have a, a, a matter particle and its antimatter counterpart, like an electron and an anti-electron, sometimes called a positron. Uh, if they meet up, they will actually annihilate one another. The particle mass goes away, and what's left over are two gamma rays. You, so you get a burst of gamma radiation in this matter to energy conversion. So gamma rays, again, uh, they're going to be coming from nuclei or matter to energy conversion. Okay? All right. So that's the spectrum. Again, the main thing, remember the visible Roy G. Biv, R, red, long free space wavelength, right? Going down to shorter free space wavelengths down to the visible. Okay. Now let's go back to the, uh, the summary notes because I want to establish what happens when light is in one medium or material and enters a different medium or material. Okay, so you can imagine, for instance, that like here's an interface. Interfaces between materials are going to be really important in the next uh, uh, topic when we, when we talk about reflection and refraction. So you might have light traveling in one material. And again, to characterize that material, We'll do that by the refractive index. That's a good thing to keep track of. When that light enters a different material, and we'll see this in the next video, it's going to refract or bend. Okay, so this might do something like that. It's not going to go straight through, unless the only time it would go straight through is if that light was coming perpendicular to the interface like that. Then it would go straight through. But if it's not coming perpendicular to the interface, it's going to refract. In fact, that's why we call n the index of refraction. It's really a speed index, but we call it the index of refraction because it's also it, it also is going to tell us how much bending we get. Okay, so here's in, uh, index n1 for that medium. This medium down here would be characterized by an n2. Now, this wave has a certain frequency, f. And in this medium up here, it has a certain wavelength, lambda 1. That's going to determine the product. That's going to determine the speed of this wave. Okay, And similarly down here, v2, that's going to be the frequency times the wavelength, lambda 2. I'm trying to write with my mouse. I should use my stylus, but there you go. Okay, V2 equals F lambda 2. Now, these Fs are the same. The frequency of the light is the same. And if you think about it, the reason that's the case is the electric and magnetic fields, they're oscillating at a certain frequency. They're driving the atoms that make up this second material. Okay, they're also driving the atoms in the first medium. Which is, which is what keeps this thing propagating. But they're driving the atoms in the second material to oscillate, the, the electronic charge to oscillate, the electron charge. That oscillating electron charge is what actually generates the wave in the second material. So the driving frequency in the first material causes the atoms in the second material to oscillate at that frequency therefore producing 
the light in the second material at the same frequency. What's not the same, though, we know, is the speed, right? The speed, V1, is going to be C over N1. And the speed, V2, we could write as C over N2. Well, if the speed is changing, so is the wavelength. In fact, if we just replace V1 right here with F lambda 1, and we replace V2 here with F lambda 2, we can get this equation. That's where it comes from, because the C and the Fs will cancel. So this is a handy relationship. If you're looking at light in two different materials, you get that N1, the same light, N1 lambda 1 equals N2 lambda 2. Okay, so that tells you how the wavelength's going to change when light goes from one material to another. Now, if we look at a special case where we let the first material be vacuum, right? So let's let, what's the index of vacuum or free space? Well, that's just one. So if we let that be free space, lambda one, I'm going to write as lambda naught. That is a common notation for the wavelength of the light in free space, the so-called free space wavelength. If we then let N2 be the material in another medium, right? So let's just call that N. So in other words, let's look at this, right? Up here, this is free space. I'll put FS for free space. The light's coming in. And down here, this material has index N, right? And this light's going to refract. Let's say it refracts like that. Well, what's the wavelength here compared to the free space wavelength up here? So all we again do, we let n1 be 1, lambda naught is, uh, I'm sorry, n1 is 1, lambda 1 is lambda naught, lambda sub 0, n2 is n, lambda 2 is lambda. We end up with this relationship. This is an important one also. I'm going to put two rectangles around that. You should remember that. The wavelength of light in a material with index n is the free space wavelength over the material's index. Okay? So that'll tell you how the wavelength in a material is related to the light's free space wavelength. Okay, now this leads us, let's end with this. This is a nice little example to consider. Let's say I have a red laser pointer, right? And I'm, shot, I'm, I'm pressing the button, I'm shining it, and I'm hitting the wall, like in the classroom. Now, the free space wavelength of that radiation is going to be around 650 nanometers, okay? In air, because the index of air is really close to that of vacuum, that's going to be the wavelength of the light in, in the classroom, right, when it hits the wall. Okay, so the question is, if we now filled the classroom with water, right, or I go to a swimming pool and we go down into the swimming pool, and I press the button, assuming that I haven't shorted out the circuit with the water. What color is that beam? What's its wavelength and its color? So if we calculate the wavelength, we would just use this equation right here, right? We would say, okay, uh, all I need to do is, let's see if I can do it right here. Oh my goodness. Let's try it right here. That's not working. I'll do it this way. Oops, sorry. I would say the wavelength would be lambda naught. So that's going to be what? 650 nanometers. And I would divide by the index of water, right? Which is around 1.33. We're going to use that a lot. Water has an index of about one and a third. Well, that gives you a wavelength of 488 nanometers. So that's the wavelength. Now, what color is that? Now, here, here's where you got to be careful, because you might think, oh, I'm going to come to, oops, not there, sorry. Let's go back to the spectrum, right? Let's look up the visible spectrum. And you might say, okay, what was that wavelength? 488. And you might say, okay, where's 488 put me? Oh, that puts me in the green. So this light's going to look green. Oh, you've made, you've made a common mistake. Remember, these wavelengths here in this spectrum chart, these are free space wavelengths. The free space wavelength of this light is 650 nanometers. That puts you in the red, okay? The wavelength is going to change in the water, but remember, it's the frequency. 
that's determining the color of this light or the free space wavelength. So the light's still going to appear the same shade of red. Okay, that's going to be the answer to that. Okay, the frequency is the same, even though the wavelength is different, right? Our eyes respond to the frequency, so, and the part of the spectrum depends on the frequency or the free space wavelength. Okay, I'm going to end here, um, and uh, I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.